on the second part of a two-part series titled The 14-Day Experiment. The first was about adopting a success attitude, an attitude of success, really shifting your mindset so that you see setting goals in a new light. Um, one that is not about beating yourself up, but about learning. Uh, when you do what you say you're going to do in a change, or even when you don't, that you go through a process of recording your successes and your lessons learned from setbacks. This podcast takes us through um, the second half of the 14-day experiment. Um, it picks up on day eight, and it's a little bit of a twist because we're looking at um, things from a strategic perspective. I grew up in corporate America, and there was always a debate on if you should be a just do it, jump in, more entrepreneurial spirit, or do you adopt a more corporate, um, large corporation perspective, and that is planning it out and working your plan and being very strategic. And I believe what Harvard Business Review said um, a few years ago that, you know, we can have both. It is about being adaptable. It is about disrupting um, your status quo, um, being ready to change and being agile. However, you don't want to throw out the concept of hovering above yourself and really um, like climbing up to the top of the mountain and looking down at yourself, like be an observer of you while you're doing you. I believe though, it, when you're doing a 14 day experiment, you're analyzing yourself in motion and that is the difference. So around 2005, about 15 years ago, I wrote a book called The 14 Day Experiment. And I wrote that book out of frustration. I, I was so um, excited to be leaving corporate America, not to leave, but I was excited to be on the new journey of having my own business after a series of buyouts um, from one of the automotive companies that I worked for. I worked for General Motors. And um, I was super pumped because I was going to go out and you know, I called them million dollar corporate strategies for business life and love too. And I was armed with all of these amazing tools and processes and really just understandings of how to plan to win and how to sustain your winnings. And it was so frustrating when I really started to attempt to work directly with consumers because the average person was not ready to change. And I grew more and more frustrated, but instead of giving up, I decided to help people get ready to change. The model that I um, subscribe to is called the Trans Theoretical Model of Change, and it is um, affectionately called the Stages of Change. And the theory is based on 20 years of research of successful self-changers. And these successful self-changers were able to navigate through the stages of change and also to keep it alive. And so you go from uh, not thinking about it to thinking about it and pondering it and then getting ready and prepared for it and then taking action, baby steps and then uh, maintaining those actions and then relapsing and maintaining and relapsing and maintaining and eventually you transition out. And uh, so those are the, the steps. And so I thought, let me take what I love, this whole model of leading change and help people to go from not thinking about it to thinking about it, to preparing for it, taking baby steps and really learning so that when they get into that relapse cycle, which most of us do, you know, you you do the clean eating and you do your diet or you change your behavior and you start to communicate in a different, maybe more assertive way than aggressive or not timid anymore. Or let's say you get really organized and you set your alarm clock and you get up and you do your morning meditation and your exercise and you read something stimulating and all those things. And then boom, you know, you kind of go back and you stop 
and you put the pounds on and you start getting up a little later and hitting the snooze or you are not as you know organized as you would want to be for example and so i believe that since the researchers tell us 80 percent of new year's resolutions fail 80 percent of strategic plans fail I believe that if we can close that gap and we can get to the point where we find the root cause that typically holds you back. So it's like, yay, I'm learning when I'm not, you know, reaching my goal, but I can learn from it and find that root cause. And then when I can work on making behavioral change in that root cause, which typically is what I call an internal goal not external. External is the outcome. External would be, for example, keeping the actual uh, calendar to be more organized. An external goal would be that you schedule meetings with your leader in an assertive way so that you can let them know what's going on. Or an external goal would be to get to the gym. An internal goal is what you're thinking about something the thoughts that you're having, and even the thoughts about the thoughts or the emotions that you're having, um, your attitude about something. So when you can get to the root cause and it's typically an internal goal situation, and then you change that, oh boy, you can really close that gap, you know, and get to the point of reaching your goals and having a systematic way to do it so you can be confident. All right, so let me share with you what we did uh, last week in our podcast, the seven days, and then I'm going to get that pump primed, and I'm going to share with you the next seven days, like I promised, of the 14-day experiment. Um, For example, I posted and commented about my third and fourth day so far, um, some ah ahas that I had, um, and I'll tell you a little bit about it as I go through the first seven days. So the first seven days, the very first day is to see the big picture and you want to do like, get a what we call a helicopter view or a mountaintop view of your successes in changing and any setbacks that you've had so that you can start to learn where you tend to get uh, stuck. And then you're able to day two, make your agenda for change, write a list of if I'm going to be eating clean, what are the things that I'm going to need to do? to change. I'm going to have to make sure that I'm grocery shopping. I'm going to have to dump out all the bad foods. I'm going to make sure that I, you know, research and remember what foods I'm going to eat that are healthy. Am I doing more of a whole food type of diet or am I doing a Mediterranean type of diet or, you know, what that means. I'm going to drink more water um, and I'm going to do herbal teas. I'm just making things up. Right. And so I pick one of those things that would be, um, You know, I'm going to make sure, like I said, for my experiment was I'm going to only buy food that's healthy for me and keep that in the house. And that brings me to my um, to day three, which is really to shift your mindset to a process. So it's about having that attitude of um, not focusing on the outcome, but focusing on the process. And so for me, the big aha was uh, that it took me to day three to really throw out all my junk food. you know, I hadn't really done that. And when I really said, you know what, for this to work, I got to throw it away. It was a, it was a big shift for me. Uh, day four is to push. Um, I, I like to use the acronym pray until something happens, but it's really about keeping on with that um, commitment. And then day five is finding the motivation, finding, because it's not always there. And then day six is to change on purpose. And that's to know why Um, I suggested that you do the five whys. Why, why, why? Why do I want to eat clean so that I can uh, be healthy? Why do I want to be healthy so I can live a vital life? Why do I want to live a vital life Um, so I can be a role model to my family, to my friends, to community, to my clients? Um, Why do I want to do that? Because it's really inspiring for me. Um, to motivate and make a difference in other people's life. And my gift, my spiritual gift is encouragement or exhortation. Um, so it's, it's natural for me. And then that brings me to day seven. Day seven is about assessing your readiness to change. And I'm going to pause there for a second and just say like, that's really why I created the 14-day experiment. Remember I said, people are not ready. When you 
ask someone at the very beginning of their New Year's resolution or their creating of a dream list or their vision board or whatever that is, are you ready to do the things that you're going to have to do? Most people say, yes, I'm ready. But by the time day seven rolls around and you've actually done seven days and analyzed it along the way, you can really assess where are you. So I can honestly say um, that where I am is I'm probably on a scale from one to 10 about, I gotta be honest, like a six or a seven. Like I really want to eat the yummy foods. Like I was sharing, I'm, I'm going through stress. And so I want to like be comforted by some mac and cheese and some nachos and some Cheetos. Why does everything have cheese involved when I'm lactose intolerant? See, I'm like, I'm, I'm self-sabotaging. That's my what I'm really learning about myself. If I know the stress is impacting me mentally and physically, why on earth would I also exasperate it by eating bad? Duh. So that's what I learned on the first seven days. So then it allows me to shift to go from day eight to 14, which is focused more on the uh, strategic thinking. So days one through seven is about having a success attitude, focusing on not getting discouraged when I get a setback, it's still a success if I win. And days eight through 14 are about strategic thinking. All right, and so that brings us to day eight and day eight is titled, Appreciate Your Strengths. And basically what I'm gonna be doing is taking you through a SWOT analysis. Um, but it's a simple one, so you won't feel like you're doing a SWOT analysis. You'll just have fun with it, okay? So SWOT stands for strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. So you'll get the hang of it in a moment. So you've had seven days in, now you're on day eight, and I'm asking a question of appreciate your strengths. I read a little bit from the book. Um, when you're trying to reach a goal, it's important to know your strengths and how to use them to your advantage. Um, and, you know, most people don't know them or feel comfortable naming them or they feel like they're bragging. And um, I go about the business in the book of sharing a story about a, a former leader of mine um, at the automotive company who was retiring. I adored this man. He was so unique. He's the one that encouraged me to really become an executive coach and go study for my master's in Christian counseling or interfaith, the integration of faith, to be a coach, to be a really sound empirically, um, sus, you know, coach that had real tools that had been proven um, to use. And so I was so grateful for him. However, he was known to have anger management issues. I remember when I did something he asked me not to do and he got off in my face and he was like, you know, pointing and spitting. And I was like, whoa, 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 dude, I'm from Seven Mile in Detroit. You're going to make me have to kick your beep and I'm going to get escorted out of here. Back up off of me, my brother. I mean, it really did kind of go like that. But we, we got to a point of respect. And that respect led him to ask me right around the time he was going to retire to help him to manage his anger, to help him with anger management. So in order to do that, I asked him or I shared with him the fastest way for us to do that is to, before we start to try to fix you, let's talk about what your, what your, strengths, your strengths are. Before we try to fix you, so to speak, let's, let's look at your strengths. And that's what I tell people to do your first seven days. Now you're on day eight and you're going to figure out out of this, out of this experiment, what do I notice are my strengths? So for him, he had a very positive relationship with his team. He had great communication skills. He was a compassionate leader. He had a drive towards continuous improvement and a propensity for change. So with that said, what we decided to do was to talk to his team and tell his team what he was doing. You know, some leaders might have chose not to tell their team, but since he had that kind of relationship and communication skills and compassion and drive uh, towards continuous improvement, and they believed he could change, he could say, hey team, I know you all know I have issues with my anger. I wanna master it for you. You know, I wanna show you that change is possible. I also don't wanna take this home to my wife that I'm gonna be with much more. And so he went about the business of having his team hold him accountable and I watched him transform and it was beautiful to see and the team was involved. And that's what it means to appreciate your strengths. 
All right. And I'm going to share a blog post. That's what I've been doing um, on the first podcast. I share a blog post of people who were going through the 14 day experiment about 10 years ago when I um, coached people through the 14 day experiment on 1500 AM um, in Detroit, Michigan, life changing talk radio. And I also use this process on the word network, a Christian uh, TV sh- uh, channel. And we were helping people to resolve their debt. But these particular blog posts come from the radio show. All right. And so last week you learned about Barbara, who is a um, former professor of hygiene and a hygienist, and she's embarking on managing her diabetes through her diet. And so she writes this regarding appreciating strengths. I am so conscious about what I put into my mouth. Today, I did not cheat and I did not snack. My glucol, my glucometer, my reading at 8 a.m. was 143. My reading at 6.12 p.m. was 127. These readings are much better than my previous readings at over 200. What I've discovered is not only was I lying to my coworkers and my husband, but I was also lying to myself. Diabetes does not hurt until it's too late, and the impact of uncontrolled diabetes is irreversible and deadly. So basically what Barbara is saying is, you know, her strengths are she's making progress, and the fact that she's a truth teller, and she wants to be honest, so she learned something about herself that she could appreciate being transparent and honest with her her loved ones. All right. Um, And day nine, keeping with SWAT, um, is uh, weaknesses. And so I say acknowledge your weaknesses. And uh, here's a little bit from the book. Um, You know, there's power in acknowledging your weaknesses. It's humbling for you to admit that you're not perfect and you need a little help. Let me let you in on a little secret. We all know that. Like I tell people all the time, I was just talking to a team member of of a team that um, I coach and I was sharing with him that we wanted to create a a safe space at our strategic planning uh, summit that's coming up. And he said, oh, I would never tell the team what I'm working on. And I said, you know, let me let you in on something. Uh, They already know that you lack in that area. It's empowering when you say I'm working on that. Or this is what I'm doing to work around that. So the truth of the matter is people know. And so it isn't until you lose out on an opportunity that you realize how much a weakness is a roadblock to living your vision. Sometimes a loss can bring the best lessons. A great poet once said, it's better to have loved and lost than to never have loved at all. So to be passionate about and be in pursuit of, and to know thyself, to thine own self be true, that's sexy. Like, know your strengths, acknowledge your strengths, appreciate your strengths, and acknowledge your weaknesses. You know, those of us who um, are people of faith, we know that when we do acknowledge our weaknesses, that's when we release it and allow God to go to work. He is made perfect in our weakness. So that's the vulnerability of it, to be able to admit that. Let me share a blog post that I think will help. And this is posted by Lisa. Lisa's experiment we talked about last week is to begin to do unto others as she would have them do unto her. And so she's working on that. And here's her post in regards to acknowledging weaknesses. If I had to choose the one thing I failed at miserably this week, it's managing my time. I made two dates this week, but only actually made it to one. I think I may have overbooked myself. I had a friend who stayed in town um, a little extra um, for one night so we could have dinner. And then when I searched for the energy to pull it all together, I could hear Kim's quote from the Bible, do unto others as you would want them to do unto you. And I kept telling myself, "Uh, this guy may have paid extra. He might have changed his flight. Like there's so much. But then the other side of me said, well, it's not like he came to town just to see me. Plus, he's, you know, originally from here. So he has friends and blah, blah, blah. So Lisa goes on to justify why she stood him up. However, she acknowledged that it was time management that that caused it. Getting the hang of it? All right, day 10. 
recognize all the opportunities. So we did strengths, weaknesses, and all opportunities. You want to recognize those. And uh, I love this quote from a billionaire, a friend of mine. Um, he's a Mercedes Benz uh, dealer. He says, the opportunity of a lifetime must be seized during the lifetime of the opportunity. And, you know, I remember when I went to a company, um, I used to do outplacement where I was one of the first responders when people lost their job. And I went to this one company and they had paid for us all to come and support them in really uh, developing uh, their next strategy for their career, get their resume together, get their cover letters together, get their mindset together, practice interviewing. And these people looked me in the face. And even though just about every other department had been shut down and they flew us in and had us come and help, they said, we're not going anywhere. They keep talking about layoffs and we've never been laid off yet. So I don't need any help from you. Hello, the opportunity is right here staring you in your face. So we had to get them to see that this is not a joke, you guys. This is not a dress rehearsal. You're about to lose your job. You got to see the opportunity was we were there to help them. The few that really did, I mean, they, they flourished. They figured out what they wanted to do or if they wanted to retire. They got good cover letters, resumes, practiced their interviews, found out that they found a job that they either loved as much or more. All right. And so the uh, day 10 blog post that I want to share is by Sherry. And Sherry's our author that you learned last week is working on making sure that, you know, she's writing a certain amount of word count and really working on her novel. And regarding uh, recognizing the opportunities, she says this, I sent two of my short stories to 12 publications and received one rejection letter from one story. I also completed 2000 words toward my novel and bringing the word count to 75,000. And what do I focus on? The rejection from the one story. It will go in the pile with the others. Mind you, even with previous publications under my belt, I still dread getting rejection letters. Dread, she says. So she's realizing that she has to overcome that. The opportunity would be to get over being a dreadhead regarding rejections because she's never going to be able to be an effective writer if she gets in her head about rejections while she's writing. So that's her opportunity. All right. Now, day 11 is face the threats. So strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats. This is the last part of the SWAT. It's really about you know, facing those giants. They're the things that threaten to derail you in the near future. Um, when you're attempting to make a positive change in your life, chances are that you will at some point hit a roadblock. I talked about the fact that even if you don't in the beginning, it's very likely that you will um, during the relapse period time when you just start to get kind of cocky. I'm doing it. I'm doing it. I'm doing it and doing it and doing it now. And then bam, you get off your schedule, you quit being so disciplined, and then you get into a relapse. So sometimes it's downright scary to face your giants, and then you start to self-sabotage yourself out of fear, fear of success. You know, if I overcome this threat, it's going to mean I have a huge responsibility that I'm going to have to do to maintain it. You might be afraid of that. So let me share a blog post from Barbara, the one that's watching her diet for diabetes, and here she goes. As I read my comments, I know that the biggest change that I have to address is my food addiction issue. Ooh, she's getting deep. Yes, I love food, I love to eat. So today I printed a picture of an alligator and placed it on my refrigerator and my kitchen cabinet doors. I hate alligators. I think they're very ugly animals, uglier than snakes. I hope the association will help me to hate eating the wrong foods just as much. 
I can remember that like it was yesterday when she put that on her cabinets and her refrigerator and it really did work. So she realized that um, in addition to that, she was um, a sleepwalker. And so she was getting up, you know, not even realizing it in the middle of the night, going and getting food out the cabinet or the fridge. But now at the corner of her eye, she would see one of her big fears, which is the alligator and that's how she overcame it but the threat was she loves food the threat was that she was also a sleepwalker okay and that is day 11 and then by day 12 I suggest that we have a breakthrough I say be strong and break through and I say we because the SWOT analysis is a pretty popular tool in corporate America and in marketing um, also. So strategic planning and marketing. I believe you can use it for your life as well. So what you would do is you would grab a couple S's and maybe a W and say, this is how I can overcome a weakness. You can grab a weakness and look at that compared to a threat and analyze internal, external. Grab an opportunity, put it next to a weakness, inspire yourself. So I sticky note them so that I can grab them and I put them together and it just inspires me. But think about it, no matter what solution that I pick to overcome a challenge, if it comes from my SWAT, it's valid. Doesn't matter really which sticky note I pick, they're all valid. So I write about breaking through that your process is going to help you to brainstorm ways to leverage your strengths, to overcome weaknesses, to take advantage of opportunities, and also to navigate the threats that come to derail you. The post is by Alan. Alan was our experimenter that was looking for another job, but he's working right now, so it was very hard. Um, he does work on computers, and the last thing he wants to do is do more computer search online, but that's what he has to do. So he writes about the breakthrough. Let's hear about Alan. I am happy to report that I've made some progress with my networking and job search. I actually took off work two days this week to devote to the cause. I haven't found a job yet, but I was able to make contact with advisors and gather inf information regarding um, the career outlook. So that was exciting for him that he took some time off from his current job to really um, prepare himself for the new job. And he had vacation days, so it was all legit. All right, you get that? And day 13 is entitled The Big Payoff. And see, when you are reviewing your strategies that you create through the SWOT, the next step is to examine each one to determine the payoff or ease of implementation. So the payoff is high, ease of impl implementation low, that would be ideal or payoff high, ease of implementation high, that's ideal. The, so if the payoff is low, but the ease of implementation is low, that's sort of a just do it. But if the payoff is low and the ease of implementation is high, meaning it's hard, uh, don't do that. So you start to, to do a payoff analysis and how much effort you're going to have to expend in order to pick things to make, have them be your bold moves. Um, and so once you've assessed your payoff, you want to develop a simple action plan for each um, of your areas that you want to leverage your strengths or overcome a weakness or uh, take advantage of an opportunity. I would specifically say focus on your opportunities and don't let those slip by. The other thing that's important to know is remember when we talked about relapse, well, relapse is only an issue when you don't have strategies to fall back on. You are primed up to solve problems in that way, then you won't have setbacks. You'll just have, or let me say it better, you will not be stalled. You'll have a little bit of a stumble, but you won't be stalled. Yes? And so here's a post by Barbara about, uh, about the relapse plan. I'm going to see my endocrinologist to get retested soon. So I'll know just how successful I've been since I started my new way of eating. This particular week, I went to a housewarming and the menu consisted of traditional African-American uh, menu. The feet of the pig, fried chicken, fried fish, chitterlings, rib, coleslaw, uh, spaghetti, mac and cheese, cornbread, greens, beans, candies, and punch and beer and spirits, she says. 
boy, oh boy, did it look good, but she said, I made good choices. Go, Barbara. Go, Barbara. She says it was much that I didn't even desire to eat. So her big breakthrough was she knew she was going to see her doctor that was holding her accountable. She went to, you know, a party and it was all these different foods and she passed the test because she kept her eye on the prize. And that was her breakthrough was to have someone to hold her accountable and then to be able to live your life, not not go to parties. And so that's day 13. And then last but not least is day 14. And you remember at the end of the um, seventh day is sort of a pause to say, you know, how am I doing? And am I really ready to change? Well, similarly with day 14, it is time to celebrate. Celebrate now. Boom, boom, boom. Right? It's time to celebrate. And, um, and so how do you celebrate? Well, I think you plan that out too. What are you going to do when you get to day 14? Remember, we're just talking about process. If you go through your experiment and you make it to day 14, analyzing yourself, what are you going to do? Manny petty, get a massage, go hit some uh, balls on the, um, you know, golf course. Now you could also play a game with yourself. If I'm successful, um, eight days out of 14, then I'm going to do X, Y, Z. So you can make a game out of it and celebrate. Here's a blog post by Sandra D. Sandra D is working on love. Um, and here's what she had to say about celebration. This experiment has been such a blessing to me because I've been able to share my feelings with others and learn about what I am truly looking for in a mate. I'm excited and I am challenging myself to let go of my fears by writing them down in my interactive journal. So I'm going to enjoy myself in the dating process and not put any extra pressure on myself. I've been socializing with friends and I'm going to take a dance class and learn how to step. So she's got a lot of different things that she's saying that she's going to do to celebrate the fact that she made it on the other side of her experiment. Now, here's the catch. Once you do all 14 days, you step back from it and you say, what's my next move? Am I ready for a bold move or do I want to do another experiment now that I really know what I need to work on? The 14 day experiment is not just 14 days. It's a way of life. It's a way of looking at how you set your goals and sustain your goals.